VPF. Is anyone familiar with VPF? Raise your hands. Just so that we know, you know, how much to explain about that. Great. So I'm uh, Lorenzo Fontana. I work at Influx Data in the SRE team. We, uh, Influx Data is, you know, the creators of Influx, Influx TV. Maybe anyone knows. I'm not talking about Influx TV. I'm just talking about how we use VPF programs in our Kubernetes clusters because we have, you know, a cloud offer that uses Kubernetes and then we have to do performance analysis. So we pick VPF. BPF, eBPF stands for Extender Berkeley Packet Filter. Berkeley Packet Filter is a technology that has been in Unix machines for like 20 years. It, has, it was born around the idea that you can get information about your packets flowing in your network interfaces. So you have a network interface and you can load a BPF program to you know, do things like you know, filter packets, right? You want to filter only, like, allow only packets on port 8080 on TCP. So HTTP packets, for example, you create a Berkeley packet filter to do that, right? In Linux recently, in your kernels, like, well, not very new now, like after 3, 3 like going 10, well, it's not new now, but it was new at some point. Uh, with your kernels, as we introduced this concept of extender, extended Berkeley packet filter because the interface seemed enough extensible to create you know, different features, right? So you can use now uh, VPF programs in Linux you have to do other things that not working, like to understand you know, how your disks are performing, how your application are performing, to filter C's, all these kind of things. We are seeing an overview of that. The main concept of this talk is that BPF is a tracing framework, so we are using uh, BPF program as um, utilities, as you know, as our main entry point to get out tracing information from the kernel, right? Uh, like uh, how many packets are flowing to that interface, how many uh, bytes are written for that specific file in my machine, these kind of things. Uh, you can actually use BPF program for you know, a lot of different tasks, like you can really filter your packets or really, you know, interact with how programs interact with your operating system, like you can, we will see that, filter syscalls, but this is not the main topic of this, for this talk, I will explain that. As I said, BPF itself, it's not like a, a great deal, I mean, BPF is used to access tracing framework in the kernel and other kernel subsystem. Our interest is around tracing frameworks because it's performance analysis, not whatever else. But those tracing backends, backends have been already there and have been used for a lot of other purposes in the past, like with Perf, with other tools. It's nothing new. I mean, you can use static trace points, dynamic trace points, these kind of things with other uh, kind of interaction points. Like you can write a kernel module to access a static trace point or whatever, you can use a program that already does that for you, or you can write a BPF program. But this may, maybe doesn't make sense for us, but do me. And on the static trace points, those are hooks in the kernel, right, that have been written by kernel developers that already have some kind of information pre-made for you to be extracted, right? For example, like, um, the C center set of trace points allows you to get information about when some application interacts with any syscall in when it enters use, when, when it starts using the syscall and when it ends using the syscall. With C center you get the start and with C center, with C uh, exit you get the end. Um, and then there are dynamic trace functionalities, right? So with the static ones, there's some functions remade by kernel developers that you cannot you know, change unless you recompile your kernel and you have some. But the real goodness is when you use dynamic trace functionalities, right? So you get to program your own functionalities so that you can extract information to one, right? And that can be for your own application. So you add, uh, in this case, those dynamic fun functionalities for application are called uprobe, user probe, right? And then, like, you can 
I want to get the return value of this function in my code, you add a uprop there and you get the return value. We will see that in an example. Or for kernel function, you use key probes, the kernel probes, <laughs> that you can use to get like an argument or return value of a function in the kernel. Let's say that you are writing some file in the file system. Every file you write goes through a function called VFS, read and write in the kernel. You can put a new probe there, get the first argument, that's a file name, the second argument, the byte of uh, this, re this writing, the, the, this uh, written chunk. And then there are XDP programs that are allowed to program your network data path. And USDT programs, anyone is like familiar with Node.js? Maybe? Okay. Some of them. Um, Node.js, maybe not everyone knows, but they have a very well implemented USDT mechanism so that uh, they basically implemented like um, static trace points for you, right? Because Node.js is a dynamic language, so you cannot like attach to that specific function, mm -hmm. but you should have like, sh you, should have you should attach right to, you know, the function in C that compiles that function for you and these kind of things. But with USDT, you can, you know, directly attach to the, your program function in JavaScript, right? This is not covered here, but just to say. The idea when talking about tracing and BPF programs is that you aggregate a ton of kernel events at kernel side and you extract all the, uh, a few of them in user side, in user space, right? So you just, like, let's say that your kernel is receiving a million packets a second. You don't have to, you know, go there and take all the packets and then count them in user space. You can do the counts already in kernel space so that you do only one context switch instead of like a million context switches, right? This seems boring, but the demos are cool. And so the idea is that, as I said, okay, I was distracted, sorry. Uh, <laughs> they are doing whatever they want. Um, the idea is that you, with your user space program, can load programs in the kernel that you have written in user space without having to compile a kernel module or without having to load a kernel module, right? And how that works is that your user program compiles some BPF bytecode. BPF is also called as a virtual machine. It's not really one, but it has its own instruction set and your compiler compiles the program for against that instruction set and then it loads the program using a syscall in the kernel on this other side and that program is analyzed by i mean the kernel doesn't allow you to load everything you want inside it right because you can kernel panic or like destroy this machine just as you can with a kernel module but that's all for your fault then but and then it has this static verifier that basically checks if your program will learn the kernel and if it does it will block your program not allow loading it and then with that program you can access all the traces back and we have been talking about key probe view probes uh, etc and then you can use your program can access a built-in called bpf maps that are a way for your bpf programs to communicate the data they get to user space, right? So your user space program attaches to a BPF map and it gets information that are um, collected through the kernel side, right? You can have a BPF type, BPF, are, BPF maps are of different types. There can be maps, slash maps, these kind of things, arrays. And like if it's an hash map, you just traverse it and you get information from the hash map, right? Or you go to that specific index and you get information. But, you know, this thing seems very boring. I mean, that's what you're saying there. So, um, we might want to see some examples of like tools that we use every day. So anyone uses TCP down here? Or ever used it? Raise your hands. Who knows what it is and doesn't use it? Okay. TCP dump is a tool that lets you see a view of the packets in your s that are flowing in your system, right? So you do TCP dump, 
If you just do it, you will see all the packets flowing in it. If you pass a filter like IP and TCP port 80, you see all the IPv4 packets flowing through TCP on port 80, right? You have a web server that's receiving traffic. You want to see if, if it's receiving traffic, you do TCP dump, IP and TCP port 80, and you see all the traffic flowing. Yay, this thing is working, right? How that works internally? I mean, internally that uses a BPF program, right? When you do that, it creates a BPF program for you that is really done by LibPCAP that get the syntax and creates a BPF program. And you can dump the program with this argument. So if you pass that program, that argument, you will not see the output, but you will just see the, B, the compiled BPF program. And in this case, that means, like, is this an Ethernet IPv4 packet? So this section is that, so this part. This is just some loading from the registers. And then a check again on those loads. Is this uh, going on port 80? And again, is this, uh, is the, the first was, is this coming from port 80? And this is, is this coming, is this going to port 80? Just because here you didn't use EP and uh, TCP destination port 80, right? If you use EP and TCP destination port 80, you will have seen just uh, this part here, right? So when you write your TCP dump program, you might be aware of that. Another very common use case, anyone knows seccomp here? Seccomp, no one? Okay, great. Anyone knows containers? Docker, right? Okay, great, that's nice. Um, <laughs> Um, if you use Docker, you will get, you know, to get your container, right? I mean, container is a, a made up word. You have a lot of different things that together made a container, right? So you have uh, Linux namespaces, you know, network namespace, process namespace, mount namespace, and you have, you know, at that point, when, you have, when you're in your namespaces, the kernel is still shared, so it allows you to do the syscalls, right? You can do a syscall to escape the namespace, so you need something that blocks your syscalls to don't become like capsis admin or become root, right? So if you need that, you need you know a tool that enforces that. That tool is usually second in Linux machine, right? In Docker it's second. It turns out that you can create second policies using BPF programs, right? So instead of having like a static, you know, second profile that's you know maybe your configuration file you write a bpf program right here like here that does some logic on top of that right so in this case i mean this example i, I could have made this example by just making a second profile but you want to make it to a bpf program so it is very simple so right in this case what i want to do is Printing a line, then install this filter, and we go with this function here. This BPF assembly means load a filter that, that with any given syscall block it, right? And you give the syscall number to it so that it can block it. The syscall number is get with a constant that is an error write from the kernel, so we, we want to block every write that goes um, from now on, so every sys write is blocked, right? And after the installation of this filter, I, I expect that this error is given, hyper, right? So you're not allowed to do that. And that's what happens here. I mean, I, I compile the program and run it, and then I run with, with, with trace so, say, so that I can see what the kernel is doing with that. And it just prints, hey there, but then, when I try, well, it, it loads uh, the second program. But then when I try to write again, it gives me back hyper, right? So if I would have written some more complicated program here, right? Like go to check in this index if this process ID is allowed to do writes, for example, I could have blocked only the writes for a specific process ID or whatever. This technique is a lot used 
in um, you know hypervisors also like Firecracker. Anyone knows Firecracker? From it's a recent tool made from <coughs> made by Amazon to for Lambda, right? They use that for the Lambda infrastructure. That Firecracker for the isolation part uses second VPF. More practical examples. What can do? What can I do with that? Trace file opens by file name. Uh, get go runtime events, firewalls, trace all commands in a bash shell. You can write a keylogger, write these kind of things. Interesting. But I mean, for the rest of us, that I mean, we see a nice VPF program in some examples, and we just want to run it. How we do that? There are some higher level APIs for us. I mean, not every one of us knows how to do a syscall, but we use computers every day, right? The first level of indirection for user is uh, using you know, a simple interface, maybe for a more higher level language. In this case, you, if you are a Go programmer, you can use Go BPF. That is you know, a set of bindings for Golang that allows you to load BPF programs using Go, right? So in this case, for example, you have these BPF program written in C, you can write BPF program in almost whatever language you want, right? You can write them in Rust, you can write them in C, you can write them in whatever language. The important thing is that they get compiled to BPF bytecode. Clang has a backend for BPF bytecode. So every programming language that compiles for the LVM, you can use it for BPF programs, right? Well, some of them are buggy, but you know, um, it just a different thing. And uh, in this case, I'm, I will, I'm using Clang to compile this program. Mm -hmm. And what I get out is an ELF file, not compiled like for x86-64, that's my architecture in this machine, but for BPF, right? Mm -hmm. Then I can use Go to load that binary. You remember the image before, there's a user space program that loads a BPF program. And it creates, in this case, a new module. It uses concept of modules, loads it in the in the kernel, and load the U probe I made. In this case, I made a new probe called get return value that is used on the read line function of bash of the binary bin bash because U probe are attached to your user space binaries, right? So that in the end, what happens here is that I get all the read line events. Bash is a program, you know, everyone knows Bash, probably, uh, that allows you to do your shell commands, right? Every time you do a shell command, there's a function in Bash called read line that uses lib read line that receives your command and passes it to Bash. That part is a part of Bash that, you know, get, you know, the input from the terminal. And it turns out that with a U pro program, you can get that and get the string so that you know all the commands that have been run this machine. Right? You know, like for security reasons, whatever you want to do with that. And here's just some Go boilerplate because it's nice that we go Go as uh, channels, so you can create like concurrency around how you get the information from the maps. So it, it's interesting because you can read multiple maps and um, you know extract information in a concurrent way in a very easy way. Like if you have to do that in C, like you have to do like P-threads, you know, this kind of thing. Seems to be more boilerplate. And even more high level, there's a tool called BPF Trace from IOVisor that is a domain specific language just for BPF programs that is looking like this. You can use just BPF Trace, that she, and this, in this case, you just do a trace point you know, stated trace point, first slide, on sys exit read. So every time the, sys, the read syscall is called, when it finishes, give me a trace point, and then you get the return value, and then you do the sum of the return values you get from it. You know, these kind of things. Or you can create a real program in a file that you execute, and in this case it's in sys and the read, and for every specific process ID, it gives you the time uh, spent in, uh, in reading. And when you start it, it gives you an histogram of the reads. I mean, 
we have this example later, so I can show you live. This slide is a bit more comprehensive of all the kind of BPF trace program you can use with BPF trace. We have been talking about trace points here, right? But you can access a lot of different levels. Like you can create U probes. U red probes are the same thing as U probes, but they also give you the return value of the function, right? Makes sense? Key probe, the same thing. Or you can access directly other information. You can get the actual um, CPU, number of CPU cycles. So you can get the actual uh, frame rate of your CPU, these kind of things. But, I mean, you said Kubernetes is the Python. We didn't talk about Kubernetes, so let's talk about it. Recently, um, me and one of my colleagues at TTC, Leonardo, we, you know, we have, as I said, this set of Kubernetes clusters and we needed to load VPF programs on them and we made two tools. One is called kubectl trace that allows you to schedule BPF trace programs in a Kubernetes cluster, the BPF trace program we've just seen, and one that's called, how it's called? BPF, kube BPF. I, mean, I also rem don't remember because we changed the name like 30 times. And <laughs> I mean, it's one of the mo most fundamental pro problems of our field, right? Finding the right names. We didn't find it yet, so it will change. And um, the purpose of the other program is to let you load whatever C program or ELF binary program you want to run your Kubernetes infrastructure. So this first one, that's one that you have a demo for, basically is a kubectl plugin. A kubectl plugin, for those that are not familiar, is just a binary that's called kubectl-whatever-you-want, in this case kubectl-trace, uh, that the kubectl can read and it will treat this as an internal command, right? Mm -hmm. So this program is called kubectl-trace when you compile it, but when you load it in your machine, it's just kubectl space trace. And it basically takes the same syntax as BPF trace, but the difference is that it will schedule this program on one of your nodes or on one of your pods, right? So if you schedule it on one of your nodes, it's maybe because you want to see, you know, information about the node itself, um, like CPU, memory, or whatever kernel information you want. But on the other side, if you schedule it again against your pods, maybe you want to get some information from your specific application. This is another kind of program you can run on it. You can run on it two different kind of programs. Programs that have um, welcome that have, uh, <laughs> I like this one. That have to, uh, that, that does a stream of, you know, information to your terminal, or programs that, you know, do aggregations, right? And create these kind of histograms. The purpose of QCTL trace is to be a um, tool that follows the Unix philosophy, right? So you just have QCTL trace, and you run the program and you get the results immediately, right? So you can also write, you know, pipe it to something else, like in this case, VC data. It's VD. So VD gets, you know, the CSV output of this thing as of this QCTL trace program that creates this CSV output. So it will go on the key probe, it will attach to the do sys open function in the kernel and it will get the command that you made, the first argument as a string and it will do that in a CSV format as an output so that in this case what happens is that you see how many times uh, a sys open sys call has been made by this binary so like and what, it, what, it, what this ends up with is a list with like docker and it did a sysopen uh, bash it did a sysopen but by piping that to like vc data you can get oh, you can get 
a cool histogram that it's not the same as this one. This one is being produced by QC, by VPF Trace and you know dumped to you by uh, QCL Trace. This one is produced by BZ Data. So you extract the information as a CSV and then you know Unix files. That's a demo, right? So I am supposed to deal with this. Um, no worries, I can do this. Since professional, okay. So I have I have this service called Cattle Day. Um, that is basically not working. Let's wait for it to start. Should I sing something while I... No? <coughs> I'm just starting to make Kubernetes cluster again, maybe, you know, closing the laptop, these kind of things, broken something. Well, I have a backup cluster, so don't shout out the my for it soon. Let's use it. Oh, I'm not connected to the network problem. That's it. There's no network connection here. This one? Yeah. Great. Okay. So, no, no, not yet. Okay, great, it's working. Let's wait for kubedns. Okay, it's there. So I just apply this cat update. And let's wait for it. Okay. And I have some, you know, web application that serves cats, like we all like cats. So every time you refresh, it gets a cat. But, you know, the interesting thing is that this has a counter that and that also exposes the metrics, the Prometheus metrics endpoint. Ooh. And it has a row endpoint so that for those that use links, they can see cats. And um, the nice thing is that this you know, counter here is incremented every time. And maybe you know, we want to get that counter. Like, let's say that that counter is the information we want to get. Right? We want to see that counter in our terminal instead of in the web page without pulling the service. How do we do that? First thing, we can change our application, right? We could change our application and just, you know, expose that counter with, you know, an API or just send the value of the counter somewhere and get it. But, you know, we are crazy enough to ask the kernel for the counter value, right? So we want to do that. And um, the way we do that is that we basically We basically can go in that machine with a VPF trace program and ask for the value of the counter directly to the machine 
So as I said, you can schedule BP BPF trace program on the machine itself, on the pod, or the pod. In this case, I will do that in, in two ways. So if I need to schedule it in the machine, I will need to know the process ID. That's why I went to get the process ID in my machine. And what will happen is that it says Apache One Pro, so that when I go here, I do the update, and I see the counter increasing, right? So, yeah. Oh. 26, 27, 28. Oh, it's not working? I'm sorry. No, it is, but it's the projector. The projector is cutting some of the... Oh, sorry. The beginning of the line. Okay, yeah, I should do this? Yeah. Okay. Thanks for saying that. Um, so as I said, I'm just, you know, updating the web page and, you know, it updates the counter here, right? Nice. So I, I got the information. How did I do that? Can you see that? Okay. I loaded a URAT probe, so a user space return probe, because I'm interested in a return value of the function on this process ID because I loaded it in the node. So every cathode day program here will have been traced. And I attach it to the main counter value function that is in my program is just the function in the main package that returns, well, when this web page renders the return value, it calls that function, right? And then I just print that out, just print that return value here. Or I can do that in this way. So I have this pod, right? I do essentially the same command, but with pod slash the pod. At that point, I don't need to, okay, do the process ID again, okay, run the space. <coughs> and then, oh, did it work? Not working. What what they do? For some reason it's not working. Well demo effect. Let's let's go to the next demo. One liner. <laughs> Another example program I add is to trace the syscalls of this machine, right? So like, as I said before, a key probe on do is open, and then I just print the command and the open ed file. So like, you know, this is in real time, every command on my machine that's opening every file. So it turns out that my machine is opening a shit ton of files, but uh, for some reason. So um, that's it. And then I stop it. And all your programs are staying there you see the old trace gap. And you can always, you know, go there and take the logs or delete, delete them. And they're done. Okay. Let's go to the last useful example. I create a tool here this is like a real file program so that we can run it, like we can commit it in a repo or whatever. And this is basically getting every single byte written in this machine and it will give you the file name and the bytes written. So in this case, like if you think about it, how do you get, you know, the exact count of bytes that have been written in a file in this machine with any other, with any other tool? I mean. You can see that information, but you cannot see that information in that specific window time. Like you see the information like in the analog. You can see the size of the file now and see the size of the file in 10 seconds, but it's not the same. You're seeing that in real time. So just created the program, I can attach to it.
this kind of program is waiting for an input from me. Oh, why am I updating this page again? Um, and then when I do that input with a control C, it will dump out a set of histograms for every file the system has seen, it will give me the distribution of the writes in chunks um, that have been written in that file. So in, like in this case, um, for some reason in my machine, something is writing this storage ASTMP, I don't know, uh, and it seems that it, is, it, it did a write from two to four bytes and another that is between 32 and 64 bytes. Um, it's probably the browser. Or like I have the TCD for Kubernetes, and I see that it almost writes between 256 bytes and 112. And that's it. The other tool we have been talking about, I don't know what time problem, is the one that lets you load your BPF programs using a custom resource definition in Kubernetes that's called kubebpf. In this case, you write your own C program, like in this case, that basically just gets the counter of, a, like whenever you receive a packet on a network interface, uh, it will increment a counter on the specific packet uh, protocol type. So like if packets are UDP, you will have one when you see one UDP packet, two, three, four, these kind of things and it is stored information in a BPF map type hash. Then, with some YAML files, because Kubernetes YAML engineers, you will just load the compiled object file, LEL file for that, this program here, inside Kubernetes, Kubernetes using this uh, custom resource. A custom resource is just you know, a resource that has been defined by the user and you know, handled using a controller. So we created that in our project. You just start that container in your Kubernetes cluster and you will have the BPF custom resource. And then it loads a program from a config map, from a binary config map, a binary data config map. That is basically a compiled program of this one. And it will give you the information back in a slash matrix from E2 endpoint. So we were counting the packets that custom controller will, cre will create for you an endpoint that will have a slash matrix endpoint, a Prometheus endpoint, with the specific counters, like for UDP packets, for TCP packets, for different things. The purpose of that tool is to actually allow, you know, tools builder to create their own abstractions on top of BPF inside Kubernetes cluster. Let's say, like, there are a lot of, you know, already existing tools that use BPF programs inside Kubernetes, like Cilium, it uses that for networking. If you are building Cilium now, you could create Cilium using this custom resource for the networking part, right? Maybe better now. Last thing, but not least, is that we are writing a book with O'Reilly. We, I mean, me and David Calavera, and also Jesse Frazali is writing forward. So it will end up by the end of this year, and we are very near to an end. And if you need any resource, or like if you want to explore more, I mean, 45 minutes for this kind of topic is not enough, and I'm not very good at explaining it, probably. So if you want to know more, you can go to all these links um, and learn more. And thanks for coming here, listening to this talk.